Jazz clubs around the world are sitting empty, but jazz musicians will always have great music and stories to share. And since jazz fans aren't able to get out to hear great music, we will deliver jazz to you at home. Welcome to Jazz Home Delivery with Tim Tamashiro. Well, hi everybody, Tim Tamashiro here with you for Jazz Home Delivery. This is the show where uh, we take wonderful jazz musicians at home. We bring them to you at home. Consider it delivery. Just glad to be here with you. Uh, we're part of the Jazz YYCTD International Jazz Days. This is a virtual festival that's taking place over 28 days in a row featuring 56 Canadian artists, and we're very, very happy uh, to be a part of that initiative. Uh, joining me today, we have our friend David Dallas, a guitarist from Calgary here, who is a jazz guitarist, but he has a great love of country music. And also joining us from Vancouver, uh, the uh, Ipotamus, Ipotamus? I guess you're, you're like, you're, er he's everywhere. He's absolutely everywhere because he's that beloved uh, guitarist, Bill Kuhn. Uh, he's a guitarist and educator. Uh, here we have all three of us. One, two, and three. There's the three of us. We're in the room. Hi, everybody. Hey, well, hello. Hey. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you, Tim. Yeah, nice to see you, Tim and David. Good to see you, Bill. It's nice to have uh, an all-guitar show because it's going to be nothing but welding and, and like, hammer-ons and, right? Is that? Yeah. Right? It's, yeah, it's going to be too much guitar. It's too just, uh, much guitar. <laughs> what I love about this, <laughs> good segue, Bill, because you have a series that you do with Oliver Gannon called Too Much Guitar. Yes, true. true. Oh, nice. Yeah. And how yeah. often have you performed that? Um, we perform fairly often. Of course, it seems like ages now. <laughs> you I know, know. I, I keep in touch with Ollie on, uh, online, but um, you know, it seems like a long time. But yeah, we perform quite a bit. Well, maybe when we can kind of double or bubble and let people come together, even like people that we trust, maybe there's a way that we can have you and Oliver Gannon on the show together. Maybe there'll be too much guitar. Uh, there you go. go. For, for your, yeah, your trademark yeah. sound. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> David Dallas from Calgary here, a graduate of Grant McEwen uh, up in Edmonton. Uh, I know That's it's right. a silly question to ask, but you probably didn't cheer for the Oilers while you were going to school up there. I didn't. Yes. And it was, it was, <laughs> I had friends from Calgary too, who, when they got there, converted just to fit in. And no. I, I know, blasphemy. And they, they got, they got the McDavid fever. And I'm not going to rat anybody out, but I was. Oh, I totally thought you were going to say a name as soon as you said <laughs> <a name. laughs> I'm, lips are sealed. Lips are but sealed. I'm gonna have to have some conversations with them, but no, I uh, I brought my Flames jersey up, and you know, <laughs> there was actually where there was a lot of Calgary musicians at school. Nice. So it's nice. pretty even. It's kind of our it's kind of our go to. It was because we only have one real jazz full on jazz education now uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, of Alberta, and so that's the reason why Bill. Mm -hmm. right. so that's, what, that's what that's why david had to go up north but that's okay it was only a it was only a visit and you're back home here now and Indeed. ready to take to have your own career back home in calgary uh mm -hmm. thanks to you both for being on the show bill i'm going to go talk to david and learn a little bit more about him and he's got some music he's going to play for us as well we'll be right back to you okay i'm good awesome there he is david Hello. dallas oh you're a handsome young strapping dude Oh, you're a handsome young man yourself. Oh, <laughs> that's that's what I was going for. Is the <laughs> is the is the you know for the cheap give you know? Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, you were uh, you have a penchant for uh, country music, although you're a jazz guitarist, and you're not the only mm -hmm. one who has had that same type of love. People, you mentioned that Charlie Parker loved listening to Hank Williams records uh, mm -hmm. in his leisure. So. So yeah. what, what is it about country music that thrills you so much? Well, I've always just like loved, um, I guess you could say like American, but North American music, yeah, blues, jazz, country and all of it. And um, when I was getting into jazz, when I was much younger, one of my first introductions to it was the, the Ken Burns documentary he did about 20 years ago. About jazz. 
Yeah. So and he was good. telling, yeah, it's wonderful. Especially um, if you're unfamiliar with it, there's just so much information that you can really build and grow upon, especially some of the earlier stuff. And he was telling stories about um, specifically Charlie Parker, listening to classical, which I love like Stravinsky, but then also listening to old um, jazz records. And I was like, Oh, that's cool. And so I started to kind of dig into that and just kind of stumbled across country jazz um, influenced sounds. Mm -hmm. um, I know that Bill Frizzell is a, is a big name in that mm -hmm. kind of coming to mind. Um, and s some other musicians too. have done it in the last couple of years. I, I was really. Uh, Nora Jones was really into country, uh, adding country jazz uh, into her, into her repertoire fairly right. recently as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just, they, they complement each other really well, especially some of the, um, uh, the older stuff because I think it's the songwriting is a lot of it kind of comes from the same vein of the um, rules that people were doing for standards or for musical theater songs or stuff like that. Yeah. And then you just find out that um, some of your favorite country artists love jazz too. I know that <laughs> Willie Nelson's done just Let's have it. four yeah. records I think of standards. One of his first singles as a musician was Stardust, yeah. I think. Yeah. And it's just. Right. Um, Hoagie Carmichael. Just, yeah, exactly. And then it's just emerging some of those loves. And then you realize it, it, it makes a pretty cool, interesting sound. So. Well, there's, you know, so much of the, uh, so many of the um, sounds, especially in American uh, art forms, uh, come from the southern states. So jazz really was kind of born in the Louisiana, uh, Louisiana area. Uh, country music uh, uh, was a little bit more kind of Midwest and whatnot. However, the interesting thing is with, I went and visited Nashville and, uh, and Memphis, Tennessee, and they say that the way that it kind of splits the highway, it's almost between the two of them. It kind of splits between blues and jazz, or as ja blues and country. But jazz right. is kind of mingling around there somewhere as well, you know. So uh, they're all very, very uh, close as far as uh, uh, creation is concerned. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's and a lot of the players mingle in both too. I'm really fascinated and have um, gotten into guitar players that are in the Nashville like uh, community. Mm -hmm. Kind of session guys because they're just they're they're incredible players and what they have to do in such a short amount of time and then i kind of went digging um especially when i was at McEwen for kind of more of a an electric fusion stuff for some requirements mm. and there's a guitarist down there his name i think is guthrie trap and he's a session musician but he also plays with some people but he has some solo stuff and it's basically kind of like country jazz guitar and Nice. So then it's just, it's, it's everywhere. It's wonderful. <laughs> so this is something that you're, uh, I mean, you're still relatively new on the scene, uh, theoretically, cause you're, you know, you're still a young guitar player. Is this yep. something that you'll, uh, that you see turning into a bit of a sound for you? I think so. It's, it's definitely just, um, there's so much in terms of guitar, um, technique gear. There's, there's, you know, people who, who love the sound of a, of a big full hollow body. There's people that love the sound of a, a smaller Telecaster and then just the different influences that they're playing. Some guys really get into a blues sound, bit of a country sound. And it's as I've kind of developed and expanded and, and, and stolen stuff from other people, which I guess is how everybody gets that's their sound. Well, that's <laughs> you get your stuff. Is you after a while, <laughs> just kind of becomes your own. I've really noticed it. Um, just coming into my playing um i also i grew up to as a lot of young young guitarists learning old rock songs and, and sure. stuff like that so i think that um it's almost a natural progression because there's some country improvisation especially um stuff with bluegrass music and stuff like that where it's all it's 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 almost a bridge in a lot of ways because there's some chromaticism and stuff like that mm -hmm. which obviously a foundation of jazz but there's still a lot of kind of um pentatonic stuff that you'll find in rock so it's pretty yeah it's i i'm really fascinated that like how it's all connected it's almost yeah. like one big thing everybody's in on it <laughs> sure sure well i'm i'm excited to hear you play you've uh, sent us a couple of uh, tunes and uh, i'm really excited to see uh, what you have here you've you've chosen crazy as uh, the first mm -hmm. tune uh, to play and uh, right. this is the song as you've already indicated written by 
Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson uh, made a big hit by Patsy Cline. And Willie Nelson, of course, has gone on to have a, a career not only in country music, but several albums of mm -hmm. jazz standards and classic yep. American songbook. So yep. uh, what can you tell us about your interpretation? Well, um, I was really just looking at the, the text um, after transcribing bits and pieces of it, of the Patsy Cline version and stuff like that. But I, just to take a step back, I guess, I first heard um kind of potential for this is there's a version of willie nelson singing this live and he's he, his his vocal style um I, as we were talking about before we went live is, is super similar to jazz singers he's got quite a delivery with yeah. the the he lyrics like back that. a little bit doesn't he yeah yeah and i was like this is kind of a jazz tune and then i said this would sound really interesting with guitar yeah. because i know there was some people there's um i i love when people take uh uh recordings of songs um that aren't traditionally jazz and make them jazz but it, it but to a point where it's where it actually makes sense mm. Mm. where where it fits the original interpretation of the song and does and not go too far this, outside pardon me and then might, may not might not go too far outside exactly yeah, yeah. it's just yeah like, it's one thing to play, um, you, you know, autumn leaves with like a death metal band, and then you just get like <laughs> double kicks and you know, the tapping, and um, the, a little, yeah, we used to get yelled at if we did that at school. Yeah, <laughs> imagine, but, um, imagine getting you. Bill wouldn't yell at you if you were his. Student, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> yes, he would. He says. Well, we're gonna play this song right now, David. Uh, we uh, David is appearing here on the TD Jazz YYC International Jazz Days. This is the virtual festival. Uh, David's. Uh, interpretation now of Crazy. <laughs> Thank you. 
There he is. Wonderful. David Dallas with his version of Crazy. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. Very nice. I got I got something just to just for you. Oh, perfect. Yeah. I should have got mine out, especially since Stampede's. This is the uh Bill, just so you know, this is the uh one of our official accoutrements uh, during the Stampede uh time, just so you know. This is uh but this one I actually had designed specifically because it kind of looked like uh kind of like an old old timey one. You gotta wear it a little cocked to the side, you know. So uh that's that's in honor of you. <laughs> it's a bit of that western swing kind of it's thing. It's a little bit of western swing. I told you I used to have a western swing band. You did, uh, yeah. I called uh, Tim Tamashiro and the Bonanza Little Big Band. It was a 10-piece western swing orchestra with horn section and steel guitar and fiddle and all That's that kind so of stuff. Cool. So it was a real treat to do. So I recommend <laughs> that you uh, make one of those because it's just so much fun. <laughs> Great job uh, on crazy. Um, you are uh, kind of wondering, you know, how do you plan to move forward? You know, I mean, you're mm -hmm. still still kind of new on the scene and just basically building up a repertoire and building up a sound and uh, getting out there trying to find the right people to work with. Is right. this is this prep time now for you uh, on a new level? Yeah. Um, the the break, I guess, is kind of what I'm calling it. The mm -hmm. world break. Um, has been good. I've been doing quite a bit of teaching, which has been nice. Um, it's definitely something I think we all do, and it's super important. Really yeah. passing stuff along, um, reaching out to some people too. Uh, I've only been back in Calgary for about less than a year now since I finished school. Yeah. So I was We're just kind of getting giving really, with everything. Still before. getting used to having you back in town, right? Mm, so I, I've definitely um, was going out seeing people. It's funny because because the two. Um, places are so close. I was getting a lot of, so you're here for the weekend or anything. I'm like, no, I'm here. So if you guys want to, you know, if you want to write something, jam, if you need anybody. So that was really coming along, which is great. Um, yeah. For like an individual project though, I really like am getting into this sound. Yeah. Um, yeah I, especially with a, a Telecaster and that kind of thing. Um, some of my favorite jazz players use Telecasters. Yeah, um, I was curious to ask you about, uh, you know, what type of guitar uh, that you play, in fact, because, you know, traditionally a big jazz guitar is a is a semi, semi open body sort of thing with pickups on it and whatnot. But a country mm -hmm. guitar is more of a, a Squire or a Telecaster or, a, or God knows what. Right. But, right. So, but you choose to play Telecaster. Yeah, I, I do. I do play a bit of semi hollow, too. It's a bit it's. Um, Bit thinner than some of the bigger jazz boxes that some people like uh, uh, West Montgomery or um, uh, what Pat Metheny is more known for, those kind of styles. Mm. Um, more the John Schofield thing. But lately I've just been doing telly. Um, it's just so, it's a workhorse and it sounds so great. And um, and do you play it with a pick or do you play it with a thumbnail? With the, with a the pick, there's a bit yeah. of um, some, some finger stuff down there a bit. Mm -hmm. And especially the a bit of a country thing. There's every now and then. Yeah. Some of the the pick with the um the chicken pick kind of thing with the middle finger. Yeah. And the ring ringing the pinky. Um, really getting inspired with that. There's a young up and coming guitar player. Um, well, I guess he's a little older now, but he was a bit of a prodigy, and uh, his name was is uh, Julian Lodge, okay. and I saw him use a telly, and I was nice. like that sound. And then I was like, well, it's a bit dirty. And then actually yeah. the, the record behind Bill uh, at the garden party, um, which I adore. And it's uh, a <laughs> Becker who, we, who just passed away about a year ago. Canadian jazz guitar legend played yeah. a telly. So I'm like, hmm, hmm, there's something to this. And then I just, yeah. it's, so, it's easy to play. It's something I'm a bit more comfortable with growing up as yeah. a lot of guitar players do playing more kind of blues or rock stuff. So it's just, it's, it's really helped kind of express my own sound, I yeah. think. And do you use effects at all? Or is that something that you try to stay away from pretty clean sound? It's pretty, it's pretty clean. Um, yeah. It's, it's funny. I, I, I've tried to dabble in effects and I do them a lot if I'm doing other styles of music, but not a ton. Maybe I, I've more of a vintage style effect sound. So kind of a, uh, analog or like tremolo like that old 60s sound i've thought about yeah, using that wah, 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 kind of a sound yeah for yeah. some things but i've noticed that with a lot of guitar players um getting out of kind of the 80s where it was a big kind of washy coursey sound which some of it just sounds fantastic but some of it just almost sounds a bit 
Like you could pinpoint the day it was made because it's like, that was the sound for <laughs> 1984, December 7th. Yeah. Um, that was the sound everybody used, right? Yeah. And then, so it's, it kind of can pigeonhole it a bit, but yeah. I, I think that um, using it in certain parts can be great. Yeah. It's just something that I, I, I've fallen in love with the guitar and then with the amp I'm using that it's just, that's all I want to do right now is those because they're so expressive. Mm. Themselves. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. You've prepared another song for us. And uh, I mean, if this isn't a uh, a COVID isolation song, I don't know what is. <laughs> that's tell a really good point. I didn't even think about tell that. Tell us about this song that you've chosen for us. Yeah, it's it, it's kind of the Western song, I suppose. It's Home on the Range, traditional. That's is, that's, um, that's isolation song right there. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was getting into this one. The first time I heard this was actually, I think Bing Crosby sang it when I was just digging through iTunes, looking at stuff. Um, and, and he's somebody too, that I guess kind of dabbled in, in slight jazz vocal styles mm -hmm. and, um, or at least American forties pop vocal styles for sure. And, and then did a brought a bit of country to it too, with some of his records. Yeah. Um, and let's not forget about Ray Charles. Absolutely, yeah, right. That's really absolutely Ray Charles and and his country music albums. I mean that that reinvigorated his entire career and mm -hmm. incorporating soul and and jazz and country. So this yeah. is a, this is an exciting journey to be on for you, and I'm sure that it's just going to go into amazing places. I'm going to play that song for you now. Uh, our friend David Dallas is here with the TD Jazz YYC International Jazz Days Virtual Festival. He's got this version for you, your COVID song. It'd be nice to be on a ranch right now. You'd have lots of room to run around. <laughs> Here's Home on the Range. <laughs> Thank 
jaar. Home of the Range. I do love that song. It is just a, it's a, it's a, it's a song in the purest sense. You could go yeah. anywhere in the world and sing that and Country Roads, and everybody would know the lyrics to them. It's definitely one of those. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Great yeah. job, David, and it's been a real a thrill to have you on board on the show. I'm going to bring uh, Bill in here, and uh, there's the three of us again, the three Wonderful. amigos. See. Sí. Bill, I wish that the, the the strange thing about being on the air is that you can't hear uh, what's going on. But uh, I can I can assure you that David did an amazing job, and and he's <laughs> going to send you videos of him playing his songs. I'm going to be checking out his his uh, recordings just after this show because this is my first time meeting David, yeah. and uh, I hope hopefully not the last time. Yeah, absolutely. There you go. Absolutely. You'll have to you'll have to get some lessons from Bill Kuhn. Yeah, ah, absolutely. Right. Maybe I'll yeah, Maybe that'd be wonderful. wonderful. Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the other way around, right? <laughs> Thank you so much, David. I'm going to go talk with Bill. Thank All you. Right. All righty. Here we go. Bill, it's just you and me. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here with us. It's a real pleasure, Tim. Thanks for having me on. The pleasure is mine. I've been uh, playing your records, you know, when I was on CBC. Gosh, it seemed like there was a Bill Coon spot uh, pretty well every second show. So that was uh, hopefully uh, your bank account just grew from all that CBC <laughs> royalty money. Well, yeah, you know, the the being the jab position, you know, that is kind of, uh, it, it's it's sort of like being part of the royal family. The money just keeps rolling in. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Heaps of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad uh, I'm glad to have you on the show, and it's great yeah. to to really spend some time together with you. When you were a young guitarist like David Dallas, uh, you'd go out and reach out to guitarists that uh, were really well established and uh, and quite uh, famous, in fact, to uh, for lessons. So, how did you go about getting in touch with a guy like Ed Bickert or Jim Hall for lessons? Yeah. Yeah, well, the the uh, Ed Bickert uh, story is kind of funny because, I've, of course, I had known about him uh, listening to the records and, you know, I was just such a big fan. Um, so I was in Toronto visiting my mother, who was living in Toronto at the time, and I was living in Montreal. So I, I, I saw that the Boss Brass was playing, and I went down to the club to hear the Boss Brass. And, of course, that's Ed plays in that. And yeah. you hear about maybe like one solo the whole night from Ed because there's so many other great soloists in that band. So after the, the evening, um, I, I figured I wouldn't bother him on the break. After the evening, I go up to him as he's heading out the door with his guitar in hand. And I said, Mr. Bickard, I love your playing. Um, can I get a lesson? No. And he walked off. <laughs> <laughs> Not with it. Um, so, but I, you know, I, I'm tenacious. So I, I managed you to persisted. see that, <laughs> Yeah, I persisted. I managed to see that he was, he was, um, he was playing and teaching at a jazz camp in Kitchener of all places. Yeah. And so I applied to the camp and I went there about a year later and met him and, and got a lesson from him, which was, which was a real highlight. What did the, what was the jazz camp all about? So is this for adults? Is it like an extended education type of thing or? I would say there was more for, you know, um, older high school students and, you know, young, young, younger folks. Yeah. Um, so I was there in my early twenties and I, I definitely was, was, uh, Actually, I met some interesting. I met some people that I still know, like Brad Shigetta, for example. Wow. Yeah, I met Brad Shigetta there at that particular camp. I bre I believe that also. I don't remember really remember meeting him, but Grant Stewart was at that camp as well. So, anyways, small world. It was an interesting camp, and I got the the last lesson f from Ed just before the second week of the camp uh, went <laughs> bankrupt. Uh, so, you know, talk about no getting in under kidding. fire, right? You got in yeah. by the skin of your teeth. Mm -hmm, totally, totally. So, so what happens guess, in a lesson with Ed Bickard? Well, Ed, Ed, you know, Ed is a is a is is so such an amazing musician and such an amazing uh, listener and such an amazing guitar player mm -hmm. and very unique. Right, he's got his own style. Um, but the one thing I don't think Ed really enjoyed was teaching, mm -hmm. and so I could kind of sense that from the the group lessons that we were having. And so when I had the private lesson, I thought, okay, you know what? First of all, I'm going to get him a cup of coffee because he loves coffee. So you I brought, brought him a cup, cup of coffee. Cup of coffee. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> you know, buttered him up. Yeah. And then uh, took my little, you know, super scope tape, re tape recorder and, and recorded him playing songs. I just said, hey, could you play uh, Around Midnight? You know, could you play um, On Green Dolphin Street? I can't remember all the songs that I had him play, but 
um, so I, I, I just had him play those songs and went home after the lesson and uh, for for several weeks, maybe even months, I just uh, uh, transcribed everything from that. that he gave lesson. you. It was almost like he, it was homework for you because you were wise enough to take your tape recorder with you and and just let him play, do his thing. I, I yeah, I, I was just lucky. I was lucky. I think that I was that it, just the way it worked out. You know, because I got to see that. Oh, I see. This guy isn't really. He's not someone who wants. He's not going to say, "Okay, now, Bill, on an A minor seven flat five, this is the scale you're going to use." Like he was not <laughs> into that at all. So I, yeah, I just went about it in a different way. But we did talk about some interesting, you know, conceptual ideas as well. And yeah. Very lovely, soft-spoken, you know, human being. I just, I, you just want to be around Ed. He's just such a wonderful guy. It's, uh, there, there is that's a nice testament to have, you know. Is it, it you know, some people have a have a real passion and an understanding for how to teach their craft, but and but other people just kind of go, well, no, it's not really my thing. And we're going to talk about about how you realized that you, that's your thing. Teaching is your thing. Uh, mm. Just a little bit later on, um, okay. can you tell me a little bit about uh, having lessons with Jim Hall? That was that was not in Toronto. That was in New York City, right? New York City, yeah, and so I would go to Jim's um, apartment in, in the village, and um, it was it was wonderful, really, because I mean, again, another big big idol of mine, and I um, I just thought it was important, you know, you you, you think people are going to be around all the time, right? But of course, mm. Jim has left us, Ed has left us, so I feel very lucky to have met both of them, and and um, engage with them a little bit but jim was jim was kind of like ed although more um uh he had more to say <laughs> or he mm. wanted to say more you know ed was a man of, of very few words um but jim would he had a very great sense of humor he was he was very warm um he you know, we we played a lot uh that's basically what we did in the lessons is we played together and the, he had this incredible ability to lift you up as a player and yeah. make you feel like anything you would play was the right thing to play at that time. Wow. What and so that was incredible, really. It still it stays with me today. I, I think about it, and I think about me in his apartment playing with him, and that's, that's such a fantastic memory for me. And that informed you of how to support other soloists or singers or musicians along those lines so that you can lift them. Well, I think that's kind of been one of my strengths through the years is that ability to get inside the singer or the um, the other instrumental um, ists, the uh, the player I'm playing with, comping behind, and uh, in, in meaning comping or accompanying, um, and trying to, as I say, sort of get into their headspace and not just play chords behind someone, but try to do what I think both Ed and and uh, Jim did was was to lift those players up and and make them feel comfortable, but also um, give them this kind of great cushion of support. Wow, that's amazing. So uh, you moved out to Vancouver. Uh, you said it was about 1995 to play with Denzel Sinclair, and that was, those albums were were literally named Denzel Sinclair with Bill Coon. That was that was your philosophy then to be an accompanist like what you had been tr trained to do through Jim and Ed and to lift yeah. Denzel. Well, I don't know if it was my, you know, like you do things and you get into you get into situations and and um, I mean I was doing all sorts of gigs. I was doing trio gigs and I was playing with a with a big band with uh, Bill Maher and Jennifer Bell in Montreal and I, I was doing lots of different types of gigs. Yeah, but this particular. Um, I mean, Denzel was getting quite a name, and mm -hmm. so there were some performance opportunities. And actually, he was called Denzel Pinnock in those days. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so so uh, so we ended up doing this recording with just the two of us, which was a lot of fun. And then uh, in 1995, um, I'm at uh, my my wife's Jill Townsend her mm. her summer cottage or her her parents' summer cottage, family cottage, in uh, Nova Scotia. And I get this call from Denzel, and he goes, um, "Bill, can you come out to Vancouver?" And I'm, I'm like, "Well, well, why?" He says, "Well, I'm doing a show called Unforgettable, and uh, we need some help out here." Hmm. So I, I, basically, a, a week or, or so later, I was I was in Vancouver, and uh, that was 1995, and I'm I, I never left. 
And Jill Townsend moved on oh, to be with you, right? Yeah, exactly. And Jill's with me. It's sure. wonderful. Uh, just for anybody who's wondering, uh, Jill Townsend is an incredible big band leader and uh, musicologist herself. So uh, this is a very musical family. There's there's no loss for a melody in in your home. Yeah, that's right. Well, it's kind of fun. We you know if we're writing music, then I get to I get to uh, run things by her and and vice versa, and that's 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 nice. Uh, you know she'll. She'll be honest. I can tell by her face whether she likes something or not, and that <laughs> it's always good to have an honest reaction, right? That's, a, that's so. something. That's that's a that's a rare thing in a, in a marriage to have a real good, honest, you know, music reaction that's professional. Because my yeah. wife is always going, "Sing the other one." Sing the other one. <laughs> She's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so you've uh, cre- you've prepared a couple of songs for us as well, and I'm yeah. really excited about uh, this. Uh, the the first song that we have is Black Orpheus. Why is this song so delicious for you to play? Well, first of all, I, I play it in A minor, so there's open strings on the guitar, which is just incredible. Hmm. I'm, sure, I'm sure David understands that part of things of having open strings when you're playing solo guitar. So in this time of of, of sort of being by ourselves and working on our own thing. Um, I, I decided to go with that particular tune. Um, and also I just love the feel of the tune because it's, uh, it's, it's a bossa nova, mm. um, really created around the beginning of the, of the bossa, you know, craze in Brazil by Luis Bonfa. Make out music. The, what's that part? The yeah. Bossa, make out music. bossa nova was known as make out music. Oh, I, I didn't actually know that. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I never, They'd have okay. make out parties and play bossa nova. Uh, okay well um, <laughs> there you go you can think about that while you're listening to this tune yes um, but uh, yeah it's just and it's a beautiful melody let's let's face it that's yeah. just a great melody that he wrote so um and i love i love good melodies so there it is well we love good melodies too so we're gonna play it right now bill coon is here as part of the td jazz yyc international jazz days virtual festival i'm uh, really excited for you to hear this interpretation of black orpheus make out if you want to Here's Bill Coon.
There he is, ladies and gentlemen, Bill Coon playing Black Orpheus. Thank you so much. I'm have the applause button pushed for you. Oh, this thunderous dude. applause for your wonderful yeah. job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Very nice. This is a this is a new world for you to uh, to record music and to and to put it up on the internet. It is. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my friend Brad Turner has lent me a couple of mics. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. That's quite a mic um, that you got in front of there, too. This is, if people are looking to see that little red uh, square that is on the corner of the microphone, that means it's a really good microphone. Yeah. Yeah. One isn't so actually my, you know, I actually sound more like uh, da- Donald Duck, but this mic sounds like <laughs> It just brings down more yeah. of the deep, dulcet tones, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now, you thought that you'd miss gigs a lot more than you are, but you've chosen to kind of look at this time together in, in a different lens. And the person that you cited when we were talking earlier was Sonny Rollins. Can you tell me why that might be a kind of a time to think like Sonny Rollins? I don't know. I, I think that uh, I thought about, you know, what Sonny did. And basically what Sonny Rollins did was he had, he had I think, more than one period of um, where he sort of took time off gigs and just practiced. And one of those times he uh, famously practiced under the bridge, um, Williamsboro Bridge, I guess, I think it was. And then fame, and then there was an album that came out later, which actually ties in with Jim Hall, doesn't it? Yeah. Because uh, that is a great right. album with Jim Hall on it. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I've... You know, you get busy with things. You're teaching and you're and you're writing music, and and I get to, you know I'm lucky I get to perform quite a bit. And sometimes there's stuff that you want to work on, and you just yeah. don't have that time. And so I guess I'm trying to I'm trying to see this kind of like as as uh, as as David was saying as a, as an opportunity to sort of investigate and explore um, some some types of music or uh, uh, more deeply or mm-hmm. something that I haven't heard before. Um, and just, you know, practicing the guitar, like I've been playing, um, a couple of Bach, uh, sonatas, uh, which are, you know, kicking my butt. Yeah. You know, yeah. If, if any guitar player has ever tried playing those. So, um, and that's some, the, some of those things I've wanted to do for a long time, but just haven't had the time. So I'm really looking at it as an opportunity to, to, to learn more, uh, like, um, you know, like, like, like some, some people say, uh, they call themselves uh, an advanced student, you know, and that sometimes if you yeah. look at yourself like an advanced student, then you're never going to stop learning things. And that's really important, I think, uh, in this in this world and in, in the jazz world. I, I couldn't agree more. And in fact, being an advanced student uh, in for any person, you know, there's a there's a time right. where, you know, we go through school and we go through high school and we graduate. And then we take maybe post-secondary and whatnot. That is not the end of learning. Our lear- our no. greatest learning uh, comes from the time that we actually choose uh, the type of learning that we really want to do. And, you know, I, I look at a guy like Sonny Rollins, who literally played a saxophone by himself under a bridge for a year by Absolutely. himself. And that's mm-hmm. how he picked it. And for hours and hours and hours at a time, you know, people might have thought that he was a little loony, but he was shedding. He was building his skills in such amazing ways. And that type of education, especially as a grown up, you appreciate it more. And I think you progress more. I don't know if you feel the same way, Bill. Makes me think of, of my very first guitar teacher, Sam Balderman. And uh, he looked at me and said, so you want to study jazz? You want to be a musician? I said, yeah, I really want to be a musician. I really want to study jazz. He says, you know, you have to be a little bit crazy to do this. <laughs> and, and, and I said, I don't care. Uh, and of course, you know, many years later, I realized exactly what he meant. You know, like it's, it's a, yeah, there, there is a, um, um, you, you have to be somewhat obsessed, I think, to, to pursue this as a lifelong passion. I think, I think, you know, people talk about the instrument choosing you or the style of music choosing you. Um, but yeah, there's, there is, uh, you know, and I think Sonny shows that obsession by, yeah. by being able to do that practice under a bridge for, for a whole year, you know? Yeah, for sure. I don't know if you know this, but uh, I, I wrote a book uh, to, uh, summer and a half ago, I guess. Yeah, two two years ago. And uh, it's called How to Ikigai. And Ikigai is a philosophy that comes from Okinawa, Japan, where my grandparents are born. And uh, basically what it means is that you know your reason why you get out of bed every morning. And it could be anything. But uh, it comes down, boils down to four principles. You do what you love. You do what you're good at. Do what the world needs. And do what you can be rewarded for. So those four principles kind of come together in a, in a confluence 
uh, that is really, you know, the type of things that people like Sonny Rollins and professional musicians really go for, you know. It might not necessarily be, the, you know, the greatest living in the world in, in terms of monetary funds, but it's the greatest mm -hmm. living in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pursuing something you're really passionate about. That's, that is the greatest living in the world. And you also, I, I'd love to read that book, by the way, so I'll, oh, I'll talk to you later. For sure, yeah. <laughs> I would love to. Um, what, what's the book called again? It's called How to Ikigai. Ikigai is spelled I-K-I-G-A-I. -I -I. Okay. Cool. Available around the world on <laughs> Amazon.com. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting my own plugs in. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Now you sure. told me uh, you told me that you were that uh, there was a time where you weren't really into uh, believing that you were like a, a full on teacher, but somehow you went and, and and took studies at Simon Fraser University, and you discovered that you're really really good at it and very passionate about it. So how has teaching become an art form for you now? Yeah, I I don't know if I ever said I was good at it, um, oh, you <laughs> but, I, but I'm working at it. I'm still working at it. Um, I. I, I do, I've, I always, when I think when I started teaching, like, like many people, and maybe David maybe agrees with this too, is that, you know, you, you do the teaching when you don't have a gig, you know, and that's how I started. Well, yeah, I don't have a gig right now, so I'm going to do some teaching. And that was kind of secondary. And as life has moved on for me, <clears throat> I've started to realize that teaching itself can be an art form and mm -hmm. that it can be, it can be satisfying in a very different way. And I think part of the reason that I came to sort of have slowly come to that conclusion is because I was able to to study um, uh, at SFU here in Vancouver, um, and that was an arts um, uh, arts education um, master's degree that I did, and it was really opened me up to a lot of different ways of looking at teaching and. Yeah, and, and really helped me to become a better teacher anyways. So I think I am a better teacher for that. And and just the fact that if you can look at whatever you do and see it as an art form, mm. you know, I, I mean, you know, it's kind of like what you were talking about. Um, we can talk about music and we can talk about teaching, but really the, the big principles can be taken and used in, in almost anything in life. Mm. Um so yeah, so maybe not just teaching, but any anything that you do that you're really passionate about can can become an art form and become rewarding to you and to others. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, you've prepared another number for us. Uh, tell us about all the things you are. What is it about this that makes you melt? <laughs> well, yeah, every every musician, a jazz musician, at some point learns this tune. I think I learned it when I was quite young. I've been playing it for, for I won't even say how many years now. Ten many, years. Many decades, let's put it that <laughs> way. Um, and it never gets old. Interestingly enough, you never really get tired of this song. It's it's always, always uh, challenging. And Jerome Kern wrote this song, never intending it for it to be a jazz tune. Yeah. He wrote it for a, for a show. In fact, I think it was his Broadway last show, show, wasn't it? And I'm not yeah. even sure that Jerome Kern liked jazz. You, huh. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not sure that he was a a jazz fan. So ironic that um, it's become one of the, the, the best loved jazz standards. So yeah, I just really love this song. And also it reminds me a bit of Jim, Jim Hall, because I think he told me that he played it uh, at just about every gig that he ever, he ever wow. played. Yeah. Wow. Well, here we go. We're going to hear the song now from you. Uh, this is uh, Bill Kuhn. He's got all the things you are teed up uh, from the TD Jazz YYC International Jazz Days Virtual Festival. Here's Bill Kuhn with all the things you are. <laughs> Thank you. 
There you go. You're cooking on that one, my friend. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. You really opened it up there. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. I hope you Thank play you. that song at every gig that you do. I play it. I play it often. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's 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 still as I said, it still holds my interest for sure. It's all the things you are. Thanks so much for being on the show, Bill. I'm going to bring David uh, Dallas in here, and uh, it'll be the three of us once again, the three amigos. Wrapping Wonderful. up the show here tonight. It's been an all guitar night. So uh, thank you both for sharing your brilliance. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Tim. It's yeah. been a, a real pleasure. Yeah, Absolutely. it's so, it's so much fun, and you know, I know that there are so many people that are passionate about the guitar, especially. I didn't get a chance to to talk in depth about the technical stuff of your guitars. I saw that beautiful guitar you got sitting in the corner there too, Bill. I wanted to ask you about that, but oh, yeah. uh, we'll have to do it on another show, I guess. Exactly. We'll do yes. another show. Yeah. Well, you're both Absolutely. welcome back here anytime, yeah. and I really appreciate having you both on the show. Another round of applause. I'm giving you both a round of applause for being on the show. we got a lot of people to say thank you to uh, who have supported this festival. And uh, 28 days in a row, whew, it's a lot, a lot of work, and there's a lot of people that put on a lot of hard work as well. So thanks to everybody yeah. associated And Tim, just to mention, you know, thank you and, and Cody and, and Sam and all the people that do such great work here to make this happen. Mm -hmm. we're we're happy we're happy to do it <laughs> you guys really took lemons and made lemonade it's been wonderful to <laughs> tune in here's to your lemonade <laughs> thanks everybody we'll see you tomorrow on jazz home delivery cheers right. cheers <laughs> jazz yyc would like to thank the following sponsors for their generous support that has helped bring this virtual jazz festival to you td jazz home delivery the city of calgary Alberta Foundation for the Arts, the Government of Canada, Calgary Arts Development, Inglewood BIA, CKUA Radio, Calgary Public Library, CADME, the Coalition for Music Education, Music Monday, Studio Bell, home of the National Music Centre, Decidedly Jazz Dance Works, and the Music Mile. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this broadcast, please subscribe to this page, and if you want to receive more information about this or any of Jazz YYC's other upcoming programming, please visit jazzyyc.com and become a member. <laughs>